Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today for our very first internal webinar to introduce TypeI that we're going to unveil its new features launched through the 2.3 release that came out only a few hours ago. My name is Rim, the community manager at TypeI. Um, we have a team of three speakers today that I'm excited to introduce. Vincent, our CEO and co-founder of TypeI, Fabien, our CTO, and Jean-Robin, our CTO. They are going to share with you the work that they've done and its immediate results as the new Type I features, as well as the roadmap for the next semester. Uh, you'll have plenty of time for questions and comments towards the end. If you want to put something in the chat along the way, I'll keep an eye with Flory yeah. is going to answer some of them directly in the chat. And just to let you know, we'll send this presentation by mail later. Um, and now I'm going to hand it over Vincent to make a quick introduction to TaiPai. Thank you, Rim. Okay, so the objective is really to give a, a run through of what TaiPai is. So this is what we are uh, doing and why we have created TaiPai. Uh, so I know some of you have been using TaiPai, so it will be just a, a few revisions. And for the others, we'll give you the run through of the product and why we created TaiPai. Okay, so the first thing was that, you know, we came from a background where we developed for many years AI projects and we kind of got tired of long projects, inefficient projects. We stopped also using, wanted to move away from, from Java, from JavaScript and all this and wanted to have a lighter environment to be much more flexible and much more much lighter also in terms of project uh, development one of the things uh, we decided of course is to move to python that's definitely uh, the, the the right that looked like the right choice for us one of the issue we noticed with python though was that there were a lot of people developing pilots and many of these pilots didn't make it uh, really to the operations even though Python is becoming more and more uh, widespread, not only for amongst data scientists, but a lot of the developers. So one of the pain points we noticed are basically the various silos that you have with uh, the different uh, participants in a project. So you don't always have all these people involved. If you do just dashboarding, for instance, you may not have a data scientist. Uh, but overall, um, you know, that's a full set of people, groups that can be involved with data engineer, dumping data to the data scientists, dumping model to the MLOps guy and the IT guys, who may actually rewrite a lot of the things that the data scientists have built in terms of graphics or some charts, and they will use different tools, and that will end up on the end user. So these are kind of silos. Uh, the end user is not often mentioned when you read about AI, but they are important. Uh, we see a lot of projects where you have end users and they don't necessarily take what the AI algorithm or algorithm will give him. Okay, so you need, and we'll see that later, to let him the capability to interact with the software, to do what if analysis, different runs, comparison, and so on. So end users are part of the whole process. One of the issues also is that these kind of different technologies used by different groups, uh, which is, we feel not efficient. We want really to have a, a Python based solution that can be used every, everywhere. Okay. So what did we do when we decided to, to move to Python? We said, you know, what's available for the front end and what's available for the back end. Then we were quite disappointed. Initially, our plan was not to build a front end tool and we discovered, you know, we couldn't find what we needed and what we found couldn't make it to the kind of applications we were seeing in the in real life so typically if we look at the front end you have the easy kind of widget libraries matplotlib being the the most well-known seaborn altair bokeh then you have higher level tools but you know they're simple tools and they can't really scale to make a full-blown interface and they have a lot of limitations but they are easy to use on the other side, you've got tools like Plotly, TK Inter. I could have added also you know, outside of this uh, uh, JavaScript, but you know, these are, you need specialists. You need people who know, are dedicated to building graphical interfaces, 
our objective with TypePy is to have an easy to learn software that anybody can use to build interfaces front end and back end, uh, as we will see later. So we look at you know what was missing. We couldn't find really tools that were efficient when it came to graphical events. Tools like uh, Streamlit is definitely suffering from that. Capability to differentiate when you click on a button to run a long, a long uh, processing task. You don't want to be stuck with your graphics. You want to be able to deal with asynchronous calls whenever you want. We don't want to have you be expert in styling CSS. So you have a very easy way to, to, to style and modify the, the, the look and feel of your app. We want the software to be able to be used as Python script or from a notebook. Markdown support and, of course, large data. Not on for the graphics, it's important. Python is not really great at dealing with large data set when it comes to graphics either. So we have we have support for this. On the back end side, you will see so some of the things I mentioned earlier, scenario management, capability to have different executions for your pipelines. So we have pipeline orchestration, but we want to record every single run that the data scientist or a developer or the end user uh, runs. Uh, we want to have caching, different scoping for your data, versioning of your pipeline, and again, a very short learning curve, which is, we couldn't find in a marketplace. Okay, so that's, that's what we are. So here quickly, you can see a, a kind of application where here you have different data, different graphics, different constraints for this production planning uh, application. You will modify some of the parameters and you will find a first solution that is displayed. Then the, the user will be create a second scenario, generate another solution and compare this scenario. This is what you are seeing here. And this is across uh, many uh, scenarios. So let's stop it here and I will move into the uh, coding a little bit. So let's move to the front end first. So type I, in a sense is, is uh, you know, it's, so it's open source. Uh, you can install it, uh, pip install type I. So the first thing you will see is that type I uh, on the front end is an extended and augmented uh, markdown. So here you see markdown code, which is basically inside a Python screen. And you have your first three type I objects here. You have a text, you have a slider and you have a chart here. So you can see the syntax. You basically have the greater, less and greater signs that are the limitation, the limiters for this. The first part is actually your Python objects that you want to connect to the graphical elements. So here the text that you will be displaying is a, a, a Python expression, which is value times two. So it's going to be 20, obviously. A slider is connected to this. So it's a slider object that will be connected to the very same integer. And you have a chart here, which will display a list. And you can see that list is actually just a computation. It returns a list of 100 values. So it's a Python list that will display a cosine curve. Uh, you have many types of objects, of course, that can be managed. You can have NumPy array, Pandas data frame, different types of data frames. Uh, you can have dictionaries and so on and so forth. Okay. So here, you, you, that's all we do. And the syntax for launching this is what you see here. Uh, you do GUI page. So the page is actually the string that we saw earlier. And we're going to run this. Okay. So this is what I'm doing here. So this is going to spin a web page uh, that will be uh, displayed on this. Again, this works on both, you know, uh, your favorite IDE as well as from notebooks. And Fabien will be showing this uh, a little bit later. Okay, so I will put this uh, side by side so you can have a look. But basically, you have sorry about that you have, you know, the value that you could see. Uh, here, value is, you have it here, you have the slider and the value. So when you click on this, you can see that this is connected. So you got the connection here for free. You don't need to write any callback or anything here to do that. And you have your chart, which is uh, built using some plotly chart here. Uh, obviously, this is a simple chart. By default, it's a line chart. You can add some properties. You can change, you know, the number of traces, the color and everything like for all these objects. So what we're going to do next is to change that a little bit. What we would like is to have 
a connection between we have a little parameter here which will change the shape of the curve so if with the slider we change this value we pass value that should change the shape of the curve so one thing to do one of one way to do that is actually to directly put the python expression here so we don't need uh, this part anymore and we just save this and we can see uh, what happens when this occurs there you go you've got the curve that is being uh, reacting to this there are different ways to do that another way to do it is actually to use some kind of a callback that you can use here so that's the callback for instance because if you have two or three objects where you need to call the compute data that's not going to be efficient you're going to call this function three times so you can use a global callback which catches which the variable has changed and you can modify data and, and recompute it so this will do the job you notice the state here the state is actually to encapsulate all the data of the user it's a multi-user uh, environment so basically if i copy the url here in another tab i will be able to move the slider without the slider in the other tab moving so it's like two, two independent users and for that you need to use uh, the state dot data to to achieve that so in a nutshell that's how it works obviously you have a lot of functionality to build a complete uh, interface on, on applications uh, you have all the, de the demos on the website um, for you to have a look at and i will be moving to the second part now which is the back end side okay so let's look at this so here what you see is from the ide so here this is visual code we have a pipeline editor directly inside this so this is an extension that we have built using uh, visual code extensions and you can see basically that it's a real editor huh? so you can add different nodes here you can add it you can connect it and, and so on and so forth so th this is really an editor the blue boxes are the data nodes the red boxes are the tasks so this one is a data node of type csv you can see you can edit it you can see all the types of data you can connect with because csv excel mongo sql etc if you are missing your particular format you've got a generic data node from which you can read and write anything you want so this is a data node but a data node is anything can be an input or an output to a task so it could be like here it could be a date for instance or an integer or a python object basically an in-memory object something that is connected to your graphical interface for instance in terms of the tasks here you pass directly where the task code is in this case you just no, it is in this directory you can go straight to the code and it's available here this config uh, file basically is saved as a toml file uh, you can see it again here and you can see that you can build different pipelines so this is a small one you can build you can have a more substantial one here with more connections what you have with this is the capability of course to execute tasks in parallel you have the capability also to cache to do caching so if some of the input data doesn't change it will skip and not run a particular task if you have set like here for this task the skippable button to true which is the case here okay so once you have done that you have built your pipeline the thing you want to do is to play with it so the first thing you will be doing since this is saved as a toml file is to load that configuration okay then once you have done that you will create your scenario so scenario is just an execution and so you 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 will create your scenario uh, here with different parameters and the create scenario and submit uh, the scenario for execution okay so if we run this for instance you will see all the different scenarios so there's nothing fancy here we will just have a loop that creates uh, 10 different no four four different scenarios and they will be executed with different parameters here we, we change with the, the parameter is the date from which we we do the prediction and at the very end we have a little graphics that show the results the kpi for each of the scenario we can compare them 
So what's interesting here is that you can see, for instance, that some of the tasks have been skipped. So there are for each of the scenario, there are three tasks. You remember this clean data, predict, evaluate. The first task here is skipped because it's not the first one. There, there are four scenarios that we have run before. So this one is skipped because it has already been computed. The input data has not changed. So it immediately sees that uh, there is no need to, to rerun it. Okay. So I will stop it here. Again, this is mostly about type I 2.2. And now I will hand over to the team to take over this presentation. So we will move to the new features of the version 2.3. Yes, thank you, Vincent. So let me take over. So I'm going to introduce the version 2.3 of TypeI. I'm going to talk about the main features, the new features. So the first one, we created a, a, a CLI, a command line interface, TypeI command line interface. Uh, for now, there are only two commands, but uh, we plan to add more commands in the future. So the first one is the TypeI create that to, to generate an application from a template. Uh, I will demonstrate it uh, right after. The second command is the type I manage versions to manage the user application, your application, well, the user application versions, sorry. Yeah, the capability to run multiple versions of your, your application was already there in the 2.2, uh, the 2.2 version. But what's new here in the 2.3 is the, the, the CLI. So now you can manage your versions through the CLI. That the third command line, which is the, the type I version or type I dash V to get the install the type I version. That's just a small command. So let's move to, to the demo. I'm going to present the, the type I CLI. So I'm on, a, I'm on a, my project uh, repository, my project folder that is named demos. Uh, I have the type I command line available. So let me just display the, the help. We have Help. lost Jean Robin. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to come back just yeah. a few seconds. Maybe we can take questions if if anyone has uh, some questions or some comment for our team. Yeah, there, there is one uh, that I noticed, which is a question relating to yeah, is it a competitor to Flask? And I think. Fabien is the right person to answer. Yeah, that. well, so Flask delivers a web uh, a web server that mm -hmm. can host web applications. What we do, we we use Flask in order to host the application that we do. So uh, it's it's not a competitor. It's it's really a technology that we are we're basing uh, our product on. Well, we don't base it on it, by the way. Uh, we can install on other servers, but uh, Flask is kind of embedded in TypeI as well. Listen, I, I propose that I jump on, on what I wanted to show uh, uh, as Jean Robin seems to be disconnected. Maybe he has a bad problem as it, as it plays. I don't know. So let me share my screen and, and go from, from there. So basically, uh, Jean Robin was presumably uh, able to generate an application. And uh, so uh this is the result that uh, that you would get so that's um, a multi-page application that uh, that has a configuration uh, that is automatically generated and i'll just show uh, the config by the way so this is a visual studio code that has the the type by extensions you can see here if i select the configuration there i can also browse with my scenarios and jump on that and show my scenario here so this is the scenario we're going to work with the you know data set replacement and so forth to generate a clean data set so that's that's your regular stuff so uh what this application does i'm going to run it and this is this will present the already the new, new features from two to three so we actually create a single page at this point uh, that shows uh, the scenarios that were created in the application and you can like the, the application can be aware of what's going on so here's the scenario selector on the left side i can create a new scenario pressing this button so all these are pre predefined components you select the scenario configuration you want to work with you you provide the label you can add custom properties and so forth and when you're done you create your scenario when you select the scenario, then you have a new page that comes in, which is uh, the, the, the actual scenario that you selected can be shown here. You have all the labels of the properties that you can change as well. And the diagram that, that you shown in, uh, that was shown in Visual Studio, we have also a graphical component that represents that diagram, just, just in case. 
so if you want to show that to, to your customers. So the, the role of this, uh, the plan of this demo is to augment that by adding a, a new page that will uh, actually act on the scenario and be able to trigger it, to submit it. So if you look at the pages directory at this point, we have this rules page as we've seen. So this is augmented markdown with TypePy. So we have layouts that allows to have the, the scenario selector which is again a predefined component on the left side. On the right side, we have all, you, all the rest of it. What you've seen the condition for showing that is that there is a scenario, basically. No, no interesting stuff in the in the Markdown. We just sorry in the Python code, you just load the page and that's it. The scenario page itself is in a subdirectory called scenario. The Markdown just says, all right, so I want a scenario viewer in order to show it, and underneath it, as you show. As you've seen before, the, you got the DAG, the diagram uh, for uh, for displaying it. Again, so the PY is going to be very short, just loading the page. The init file just exports it and so forth. So what I'm going to do here off screen is I'm going to copy a new set of, uh, well, a new page, basically. So this is called IO params. This is where I want to indicate what are my inputs and my outputs. So this is, this is the markdown, just a title, a button. Uh, that lets you open a file with a file selector, and these all these are are pretty fine. You can preview that. So the new version of uh, of uh, TypePy Studio will let you preview what you've done in TypePy with need your Markdown. So if you change your Markdown, so this is a, a pretty fine feature of uh, of Studio, by the way. Uh, if I add some X's here, for example, you show them reflected in the generated page automatically. So that's great. You can just you know use your your Markdown and, and go for it, uh, and look at what it's going to look like. Now I'm going so, uh, to... Maybe to Fabien, it's, yes. it's worth mentioning that this is uh, maybe because it moves fairly fast, it's an extension also that you have from uh, Visual Code and you click on that particular button on the right to trigger this previewer. Mm, actually, no, no. There's, there's a shortcut in Studio, which is Control uh, Shift V. Uh, ah, this is okay. pre-bundled. Pre, uh, pre you don't need to do anything for TypePy okay. specifically. Okay. Sorry, Jean-Robin, I took over. No, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, and, uh, I've been logged out. So, yeah. yeah, sorry about that. So I'm, I'm, I'm running. We'll see what that gives. Yes. So now I need to actually use this new page in my application. So I'm going to just uh, import it from IO parent import IO parent blah blah. Yeah, just a word about the this uh, Python file here. The Python file is a bit more complex. We have in the in the Markdown two callbacks that you can see. One is called read CSV to load a file, and one called clean data to actually uh, submit a scenario. So these functions, uh, which are just you know seen as symbols here, are uh, actually defined in uh, the local Python file. This is uh, using what we call the page scope. That is, this function read CSV and clean data are not don't have to be global. You just you know lo localize your function, your callbacks exactly where in, in the page that you need. So this basically, let's look at that. So we we have uh, a variable which is called input file, which is the path to the file, which is set to a, <coughs> sorry, to a data node. Then we read the data node and we're happy. We just notified that we did that. So that was read, reading the files. Then we have the clean method. So in this case, we take the scenario that we selected, we submit it, and then we read the result from the data node and just, and we're done basically. So what all we do is change uh, variables in what we call the state, which is, as uh, Vincent mentioned, a way to represent the, the variable scope for, for the different uh, uh, clients connected to uh, at, at one point. All right, so we want to integrate this new page in the scenario page. So let's see, in scenario, there's nothing there. So we're going to build a little uh, layout around it so that the scenario appears on the left side and um, and uh, the, this new page will appear on the right side. So what I'm doing here, I'm creating what we call a path, which is basically a block. You see that you have error reporting, missing closing tag. This tag, this layout tag is not closed. So that's fine. That's exactly what we wanted. And we're going to create a new path. Uh, you have also the completion. Uh, the page would be IO params and we're done. Now we need to close the layout. All right, now the page is embedded within the scenario. We just load it and, and, uh, and, and plug it into the application. Now I need to change my main here so that uh, we actually uh, import uh, this uh, this page so that uh, we can uh, register it from the from the GUI instance. There we go. Now we need to uh, create a few variables, the one that we uh, used in the in the IO parents page, if you recall. And of course, we need to create the page itself. Uh, this is done there. So now we have this new page that comes in and we're done. We are also going to create this onChange function that Vincent mentioned already. 
and let's see that, let's see what that gives so this on change function will be there so basically when you change the scenario reset the fields of the page uh, from the what the scenario had, had stored uh, previously then we read uh, data nodes if they're available if you can't read them you just return none and that's it and then uh, we have also this uh, replacement uh, maybe i need not show that properly look at the markdown so here we have this little input field here that that says well i want to replace the string by another so this is where it is replace with and, and, and here you go all right i think we're done we can now run this application again we just created the new page integrate it into an existing page that we generated from the template and uh, we'll see what that gives Oh, cannot import. So I, I missed an, an, uh, an export from the pages init file. It's usually, usually what I do. So let's see. No. Mm. Sorry about that. That happens all the time. Uh, pages init. Road py. If anyone sees the problem, let me know. Uh, come on. It's okay. So that's it's a demo. IO params. IO params page. Oh, yeah, of course. So what I want to export is the page, and not this bloody symbol that makes no sense. Sorry about that. You know we're not cheating. Uh. And I run this application. So again, as you saw before, we select a scenario, we create a scenario, then we select it. And now we'll have some more information about it. So I'm going to create a new scenario. My scenario, blah, 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 create. We're good. We select it. We can see the DAG. And now we have this, this right side area that we didn't have before. So now I can use it. Now I can uh, open a file, uh, select uh, like a CSV file. There we go. Open. This will load the file and fill a table. And the, the plan is to replace all the NAND values by something else like PyPy, obviously. When I click this button, you remember the clean data function, we just submit the scenario, and you can see that all the NAND values were replaced by the TypePy symbol, which was the plan. All right, so uh, would you want to jump in, Jérôme, at this point? I have something more to show. It's up to you. Uh, I think I can take over if I'm not logged okay. out anymore. And take, take, <laughs> give me back. Uh, when you're done, because I want to show the notebook stuff. Okay, maybe go on then. Go on first. Oh, yeah. All right, yeah. I'm back. Hmm. So I'm first of all, I'm going to create a new uh, a new page uh, to show you a little bit more about the preview, as I said. So say if you have a title in your page, you saw that uh, Studio just provides you a way to look at uh, what you just did immediately. That's fine. Yes. There you go. So what I did is I created a file called demo.md. Uh, added a title and show the preview here. All right, nothing fancy at this point. So what we can do is, of course, we can add anything there, change value. We're going to add a slider. It's exactly the same demo that uh, Vincent just shown, but all right, so we're going to bind this to this. We're going to create a slider and we're good. And then if I want to preview that, now we have this slider here. The bad news is you don't have any uh, initial value, which is pretty bad. So there's a way to do that in studio. You just uh, create a new file here. That's the, the simplest way to do it. There's other ways to do that, but hey. So let's say this initial value. So we create a fake variable called value and bind it to the, the component I'm gonna, gonna express. So I'm just adding another one just to, to let you show that they're, they're both connected. If I go back to the preview, now we have the initial value set to 33. The value is bound to the same variable as well. So that's great. All right, so now we're going to be a little bit more fancy, creating some data uh, to show that we can actually load uh, more data. So that is a stabilized data here. We're going to create a chart, exactly the same. You're very uh, accustomed to that. If I show the preview at this point, now we can see the data here that was defined actually in this array in, in, the, in the JSON file. All right, let's use that in a notebook context. So I create a new notebook. There we go. And we're going to create a few cells to uh, to put TypePy in gear. So first of all, I have to include TypePy, obviously. There we go. I also uh, import the math package because I'm going to use it. We're going to create a new page from what I just created, the demo.md that I just created on, on the fly. There we go. 
Now we're going to create uh, this amazing function that you've seen before in yet another uh, in another, yet another cell. This is the one that uh, Vincent mentioned before, basically. And now these are the variables that we want to rely on, and this unchained function that you mentioned as well. All right, so we're done. Now all we have to do is run this application by creating the GUI and run it. So I'm actually running TypeI within the notebook to show this application. And there we go, we have exactly the same thing. That is amazing. The, the more amazing stuff even is that you can go back to that, change the function that you actually, that we are displaying on the fly. So that, for example, I can replace this cost uh, function with something else and run it. And if I go back to my view here and refresh, just said, oh, got the triangle now. So we move from a flute to a violin for, no, for those who know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> There's also a way to dynamically change your pages if you need to. So in this case, we need to uh, create a new cell that will change. So let's go down there, create a new code cell and do that. So now if I go to my demo file, I'm going to add a note here. Thanks here. Maybe remove this value that you don't really need. Save that, execute this cell. And if I go back to my browser and refresh, the value here will be gone. It's gone. And my thanks is there. Thank you very much. Okay, so Thank you, need, Fabien. Needless to say that, um, you know, Fabien has shown a simple one page application. You can build a multi page, a full blown application from there. Okay. So let let me the floor take is over. Yours. Yes, I hope I won't be looked at anymore. Okay, so no. I don't know what I missed in the, the CLI and the, the scaffolding stuff. The well, well, as I started with the generated application, Jean-Romain, to let you know. Okay, so so that's perfect then, because basically with type I create, providing the template, you basically generate the application you run. So thank you. Uh, the other command line, I, I, I will be quick on this, is just the manage versions command that allows you to manage the user application versions, list the application, rename an application, compare two versions, your versions and to delete a, a version. If you need more information on, on this, on the versioning and how to run uh, multiple versions, uh, you can access the documentation page. There's a, a section dedicated to the version. Let me summarize uh, what is new in TypeI 2.3 then. So the first one is the, the application templates, the capability through a, a new CLI to scaffold and create a complete application. What's new as well are the core visual elements. Uh, so Fabien, you show them a bit. So we have, for example, a scenario selector, a scenario viewer, a scenario DAG. So you can basically interact, play with your scenarios directly without having to, to create the whole plumbery uh, around them. The version management. So now it's available on the, the CLI. And what's new as well is on the TypeI Studio side, the GUI preview, which is really, really interesting to be efficient when designing your application. And uh, if you need more information, if you want to have uh, the whole uh, release note, you can access them uh, through the website on the documentation page. There's a release note page dedicated to all the, all the changes. And that's it. We can talk so about just, the... Just one, yeah. just one sentence on the versioning. Versioning is very important because we, we hear everything about, you know, uh, data lineage, about the versioning of your uh, ML model and so on, but nobody really talks about versioning of your pipeline, which is maybe the most important thing. So whenever you change your code or you have a new version of something, a model, or maybe you have a new data source, everything can be, can be versioned. And you have also migration capability for your previous scenarios remember scenarios are previous executions because we, very often we have customers you know if you change your, your pipeline then everything from the past is kind of gone you can maybe not able to see it or even if you see them you will not be able to run them again okay so that's a very important feature yeah and everything is explained on the documentation so do not hesitate to to have a look at, uh, at the page so on the roadmap we have a couple of topics that we have uh, already started to work on. So the first one, probably the, the, the most important is type I cloud. So we'll propose in the next uh, weeks, month, the capability to host your application. So just with a couple of clicks, we'll be able to 
to deploy your application on, on the cloud and to expose it to the to the internet. So that will be great. We have another topic. Uh, we had difficulty to find a good name, so we use TypeI GPT. Basically, we integrated a, an LLM model into the TypeI application. That's really really interesting. Another feature to implement would be the capability to execute and run some tasks on a remote and distributed environment. And uh, finally, we'll work on a GUI builder integration. So basically, we'll, we want to be integrated with the most popular GUI builders on the market. That's it. Maybe, Vincent, you want to... Yes, take just over? Have a, a little bit of fun. We'll show you the... Stop sharing my, my screen then. At the moment, it's a demo version. It will be a part of the product later. That's why we're talking to you about it today. So that's what we're talking about. So in terms of code, you know, this is a new graphical component that has an LLM. So we are all open source. So this is coming from Starcoder from Hugging Face, and we are specializing it to generate type by code and maybe more type by stuff in the future. But at the moment, it's mostly on the type by GUI that would be focusing. So here we have a table with date, sales, revenue. So it's a gold table. In the future, of course, we'd like to deal with more than, than one table. And you can, I don't know, write something like uh, display revenue versus date using dash line, for instance. You got the, the date part missing after versus. Versus date, yes. So that's that works something else so that's what it does so you have it here um, we can you know put the title if we want to we could put revenue on sales uh, for instance uh, here by date using uh, I don't know we put some color if you want so yellow and uh, blue line for instance should display two tracks on that particular chart with this. And you want to maybe revenue versus the energy uh, as by chart. So that's a little mistake, but it, so it's robust enough to, to, to come over this kind of so that's the kind of, of stuff that would come come up your way. Again, it will be open source. You will not uh, lose your data uh, also by going to an external website. So this uh, is really what we want to do. Uh, so that's that's it basically on this demo. Quick one just to, to give you some uh, flavor of what's coming. Okay, and the next step uh, is about a type I cloud. Maybe Vincent, you can take the lead on this point too. Yes. Yeah, you will basically be able to display your, uh, to deploy, sorry, your application uh, on the uh, on our on our website on the cloud, basically. So it will be okay. So this is going to be launched within a few weeks from now. Uh, so you'll be able to choose a machine, pick a machine, deploy your application, upload your application, your type by application. You will be able to, to monitor um, the usage, uh, memory-wise and usage-wise of your, your app. Uh, that's a free service. Of course, we are not going to, because it's a free service, you, you won't have super duper machines, but you will be able to deploy, you know, a uh, reasonably sized application um, that you would find useful to share with colleagues or ex customers, for instance. So that's something that will go live, uh, you know, in two, two, three weeks, you will see some announcements on, uh, on the website. All right. Thank you, team, for this presentation. And sorry, guys, for the demo effects. Taipei's future look awesome, and we can't wait to see all these cool new stuff to come out. Um, leading, out, leading now to some questions, um, we had two or three questions that Florian has already answered, but maybe not all the, um, the participants have seen them. Um, the first question is, can you bring a, compar a comparison with Streamlit and Dash from Arturo? 
Yeah, so on the Streamlit, so the first thing first is the backend. So there is no backend really, uh, no pipeline orchestration. It's very important for us, for you to, and that's what we try to do today to show that you need to have a fully integrated front end and back end environment to be able to, to be efficient. And you could see the type of uh, components that Fabian demonstrated, which actually uh, links the, the, the back end, the scenarios, the what if analysis, and so on with the graphics. You can display, you know, these this scenarios, the content of the scenarios very, very easy. So if you want to just a add, word, Vincent, we plan to add more components as well, visual components on, on the, the back end elements, the, the core entities, like the job management, the, the data node viewer, and data node selectors, and, and so on. So on the GUI itself, uh, yeah, these are basically the slide that I've, I've described before. Yeah, that's here. So again, the product is to be used, uh, you know, for pilot, but also for full deployment uh, for production level application. Streamlit is not capable of, of doing that for, for various reasons. First, if you have used Streamlit, the way they manage event with the caching is, is really not sustainable for, it's okay for small apps. First of all, the caching doesn't always work if you have deep, deep structures like tensors and matrices and this kind of thing. If you have very specific conditions for triggering this, caching will not work either. It doesn't make the difference between synchronous call and asynchronous call. So if you, if you launch training, for instance, that takes an hour, you are stuck with your graphics. That's not possible in real life. You have to be able to, to call as an asynchronous way. Predefined st styling is really not really their forte either. It's not working on notebooks. It doesn't have large data support. So basically, if you have, we haven't shown you that, but we have graphics that can really deal very well with whatever the charts, whether it's a line chart, whether it's a 3D chart, a cluster chart, with very large data. So that, yeah, I can go on and on. Um, but maybe the most important is the fact that there is no integration with backend. There is no what if analysis. You do not record your rounds over time and so on and so forth. We have used heavily uh, Streamlit, but we fell completely on a couple of, of applications. Uh, what I didn't say is that the product is actually has been designed with large company inside. So it's been developed with McDonald's, with large retailers, with uh, ma large manufacturers, that is like uh, Samsung, for instance, and TSMC um, has been uh, using this. Yeah, so basically, we want and you, we want you to use this in a type by is an easy product to use. So is Streamlit, but we want to be able to do more than pilot. So we are back to the initial message here. I'm not sure I've convinced you, but I think I've gave most of the points at least. <laughs> yeah, Thank one you, of Vincent. the points, sorry, just to, yeah. to, to complement Vincent's answer. One thing that I'm really like about TypePy is the way that you don't need to know an API in order to create a graphical interface. You're straight to Markdown and add your components on the fly. You don't, you don't bother with the, with all the API stuff. That's that's why I, I would you know push a little bit. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, guys. One last question, maybe before the end of this webinar. Uh, this one is from Marisa. How does TypePy compare to Shiny? Another comparison. Yes, so Shiny. Um, we all know Shiny uh, R, Shiny or Shiny R, and they're coming up with a Python uh, Python uh, version. A couple of things. So what I said to so Streamlit is true when it comes to backend. Again, you need to see TypePy as a complete platform here. We don't use the word package. We use the word platform because we encompass front end and back end, and that's very important. Now, again, if you want to focus purely on the graphics as, and compare only for type by front end, definitely uh, Shiny is um, much more customizable on the event side. The graphical events are better managed than on Streamlit. Unfortunately, you have to define all the events. As you could see, uh, what we shown you a lot of the events, you have a direct connection. You don't need to, to do that. So you have less coding to do when it comes to interaction than you have with, with, uh, with Shiny. Shiny is a very recent product that uh, I've been used, so I, I haven't tested it completely. I have no clue uh, about these synchronous asynchronous calls. Uh, we'll have to test 
but certainly more coding uh, in general than uh, what you will find uh, with TypePy uh, type GUI. Okay. Thank you, guys. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for your valuable time. Hope now you know more about TypePy and its new features. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to put them either on Stack Overflow with the hashtag TypePy or directly on our GitHub repo. Our team will be pleased to answer. Rim, um, rim. Just one thing yes. which is important for our corporate customers potentially here. Uh, we do have an enterprise version. Okay, so uh, this is needed. Um, that's also a difference with, uh, with Streamlit. Uh, we, we do provide support. Uh, that's very important when you want to go into production. Uh, many customers do want that. The enterprise version is about the same. Besides support, we do authentication authorization, but a bit more performance when it comes to the storage of all the scenarios and everything. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to add this to be complete. Sorry, Arim. Thank you, Vincent. No, it's OK. I was given an, the end. Just don't forget to pip install TypePy and have a nice day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.